what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. We have Samir Balwani of Query. You could find them at WeRQRY.com. And Samir, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out on the podcast. And um, actually, Samir, we were just talking about uh, the episode with Tony Horton of P90X. That's an amazing episode where he uh, made his money as a street mime to make food and rent money before he launched p90x um and there's other ones since this is an agency of uh, i had vicky higgins on who's interesting and she talked about how to secure a 20 million dollar 20 million dollars in sponsorship deals um she negotiated the naming rights for a stadium uh and so that was an interesting episode not your typical agency and then i kelly johnson who runs a ballast group and she does a lot of communication and PR and strategy for large pharmaceutical companies and, and large companies in general. So check those episodes out. And uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. And at Rise 25, we help businesses give to and connect their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We help them run their podcast. We're an easy button for a business to launch and run a podcast. And you know, Samir, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always thinking of ways of how do I give to my best relationships. I found no better way to do that than to profile the people and companies I most admire on this planet and have them on the podcast and have them share with the world what they, they're working on, what they're doing. So if you've thought about starting a podcast and you have a business, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com. Uh, both my business partner and I have been doing it for over a decade. You can ask us and email us any questions that you could have under the earth and uh, it's support at rise25.com. Uh, and I'm excited. Samir Balwani is a founder and CEO of Query. It's a media buying agency for e-commerce and directed consumer brands. They've created a media methodology and testing framework that's helped brands like Delcy and Peak Design scale their business online. And Samir, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. When I look at your background um, from American Express um, for years, I always think I went to it with a friend to lunch at LinkedIn headquarters. And I was like, man, I get used to this. There's like a private, there's like a private level of a yeah. chef and I stroll in the office. It's beautiful. It's got like gaming related things. I'm like, I don't even know. Why didn't I just go work for LinkedIn? Right. So I want to hear some of the lessons you learned from American Express first, and then why go out and start a business? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And you know what, honestly, American Express is an awesome place to work at. So if you are looking for a place to work at, please go apply there. Um, you know, I, I would say um, at, at American Express, my role, I was a senior manager of brand strategy. I got to work on some really amazing uh, brand campaigns, everything from uh, sponsoring the US Open to running digital ad campaigns for uh, Open Forum at the time. Uh, and uh, I really, it, it was fantastic. And, and one of the key things that I learned and one of the things that makes Amex such an amazing place to work at is uh, how um, intentional they are on hiring people management and growth. And I think that that uh, a lot of small businesses and a lot of agencies, especially uh, forget that their people are their most important asset. And uh, in the day-to-day -day management of clients, we forget to take care of our people. And so uh, I was very intentional about that when I started Query as well. Uh, you know, we're 15 people and we have a full-time HR person. It was one of the number one most important things that I wanted to make sure that we had, um, you know, we've always had 360 reviews, uh, growth plans, uh, uh, doing annual reviews. These are, you know, for me, these were all non-negotiables because I wanted to make sure that the people I work with uh, and the people on the team are happy, passionate, excited, uh, because we work in a creative world. Um, we're not just cogs in a wheel. And if you don't love what you do, you don't feel like what you do 
uh, is impactful, you're just not going to do it, right? Uh, burnout's very real. It doesn't always mean that you're burnt out because you were working too hard. Sometimes you may be working really hard and just uh, no one noticed, and that will lead to burnout too. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that there was always an opportunity for us to notice and recognize and, and give people an opportunity to uh, be heard, which is something I definitely learned from Amex and then something that they've done just incredibly well. What else does the H? I find that really <clears throat> insightful. What else does the HR person and in, in you help incorporate? You mentioned the three sixty reviews, yeah. the growth plans. What else? So Avery's our uh, uh, HR person, and uh, she, she's our manager of people and culture, and she does everything from uh, talent acquisition, so actually going out and and finding people to join our team and making sure they're the right fit for us. Uh, all of the internal culture. Uh, events, everything from uh, our virtual happy hours, because we are a fully remote team, uh, to managing and planning our annual retreats where we all get together. We're actually going to Nashville this year. Uh, we'll have a chance to all get together and, and spend some time together. And those retreats are 15% business. And the rest of it is really just for us to be able to uh, do all of the water cooler talk in a, a short period of time and be able to actually know who we work with outside of work. Uh, Cause I think that that's a, a really important aspect that's been tough to replicate in a remote agency. Do you have staff outside the U S international? No, everyone is in space. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. 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 Well, that was a strategic decision because it is, it adds a whole level of complexity um, that we're still a little small to try and to manage accounts. What else did you learn from American Express? So obviously the importance of, you know, training and, um, you know, being there for the team. What yeah. else did you bring into query? Yeah, I think uh, some people will call it bureaucracy. And I think that there is a, a, a fine balance between bureaucracy and uh, process driven uh, thinking. Uh, and I think that that's the, uh, a really good thing that Amex has done. And, and obviously it, ebbs and flows and they're constantly trying to figure out how to uh, make sure process doesn't get in the way of innovation, but uh, really understanding what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, what actually moves the needle, uh, training people on those things, uh, and then building cross-functional teams around it. So I think that that has been a really key learning for us of Okay, we you know we do one thing really well. We've created this framework and methodology for growth, but how do we actually train people on it? How do we do it consistently over time? And how do we also give it enough of um, a fuzzy exterior that we can op we can change it for some of our clients? You know, there are things that need to be adapted uh, on a uh, client by client basis. So uh, creating that has been uh, a really um, fun learning uh, and just something that's really been helpful from my American Express days. Uh, I, I think that that has been great. And then the other thing that I learned uh, from having fantastic leaders at Amex was what it means to be a people leader and uh, how you can create an environment where people can make mistakes. And obviously, you know, you have your <laughs> uh, line in the sand of do not make mistakes past this. But how do you create those internal processes or, or opportunities where people can you know, have mistakes, make mistakes, be celebrated for the mistakes they meant, made because it means they're being innovative or trying something new? Uh, and so that, that was another really insightful thing that I brought into Query as well. Is there an example you could think of, Samir, of um, like a celebrated mistake? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I probably take a, an example from uh, so from our company. You know, we've made mistakes. <laughs> we make mistakes pretty regularly because that usually means we're pushing the envelope. But uh, it'll be everything from man, everything from naming something different in how we run campaigns, and then realizing oh wait that naming convention actually worked out better in our favor. And so while you would think, you know, it broke things along the way because the name is tied to a lot of systems that we have internally, but um, at the end of the day, we look back on it and go, wait, okay, that actually makes sense. So uh, it, it, it's hard because we don't look at mistakes as mistakes, but really just what do we learn from it? How can it be adapted? And in this instance, it actually did adapt and it refined our process and we ended up moving forward from it. So um, 
Yeah, it's hard to to kind of pinpoint any singular mistake that was like a true <laughs> mistake. When you were talking bureaucracy, I thought you were going to say management layers. Yeah. Right now, how do you, you know, you came from a company, there's a lot of different layers and they're in there for a reason. How did you incorporate that into your agency? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you asked that. So uh, I feel like when I started Query, everybody was all about flat structure and it was, everybody's the same. There are no layers. And um, candidly, I think that that's a a mistake. I think um, layers and organizational structure is important. It allows people uh, to have someone to lean on that has more experience than them. It gives you an opportunity to actually um, celebrate people and and empower people that have more experience. Uh, So we do not have a flat structure. We actually do have a layered structure. Uh, We have a a coordinator level, a manager, a strategist level, and a director level. Uh, That's unlocked a few elements actually for us. So our uh, strategists are empowered to think strategically, manage their own campaigns, um, be an expert in what they do, but they have directors to lean on when they're not sure or need to learn or uh, need to have a strategic long-term view. Um, It's also allowed me to step out of day-to-day delivery and client management and have a long-term view for the agency and continue to grow. Uh, I think if everybody were the same level without having any kind of org structure, uh, we'd all be on top of each other's toes, not knowing who to lean to, who to go to for things. And even at 16 people, like we, we need this. So the different positions, cause I know you probably have different positions, um, within the company, um, or different categories of positions. Like there's HR, there's probably people managing ads and other things. Does each different kind of genre of position have a kind of coordinator strategist director? Or is that only in certain positions? So for the most part, we've got uh, coordinator roles open in every position. Uh, It it really depends on workload. Most of the time we see that on uh, coordinator needs more on our media team side, uh, where there's actually a lot of like setting up ads or making edits, uh, things like that, where uh, it's more um, in platform work versus strategic missions. The way way I think about it and... um, I would challenge everyone else to start thinking about it this way too, is the time horizon by which your your employees look at things will determine their seniority. So I know my coordinators are looking at things. Okay, what am I doing today that's going to impact next week? My strategists are looking at things on a month time horizon. What am I doing today that's going to impact the next month? And then my directors are looking on it. So, okay, what do we do this quarter that's going to impact the next quarter? And ultimately, uh, our VPs will start looking at it on an annual basis. What are our clients doing this year that will impact next year, right? As CEO, I look at the business on a two to five year plan. What are we doing this year that's going to set us up for success in five years? Uh, and I think that with seniority, that long-term view only comes with experience of this is what actually happens over time. Uh, and so that that's also where like layers has been helpful. I, I learned that from American Express too, truthfully. Being able to sit in with a VP and say, oh yeah, you know, we're building this out. We don't envision this being put into market until you know a year and a half from now. And then the expected return is three years after that. That really long-term vision is um is a is a unique skill set. Yeah. Yeah. So I love how you talk about the, putting this infrastructure in early because I, I think most, a lot of the companies I talk to don't do that. And uh, even from the HR, from the get go, you're like, this is a non negotiable. I need this because this is what's going to help build the, the team and build the culture. What was the hardest thing transitioning from American Express to your company? Oh, I think it's the hardest thing I'm transitioning from. Anywhere where you work, not for yourself, to working for yourself, uh, there are two things that are are really hard. So one, uh, you are responsible for every decision. There's no one else. You can't blame anyone else. Um, a mistake is made. Ultimately, it doesn't matter who made the mistake. That was on you. Uh, it either means that you put the wrong person in that role or you didn't have the right process in place. Regardless, it always comes to you. The second one is, and this is more of a... Um, psychological impact when you have to let go of somebody when you have to let go of someone at a large agent at a large company or anywhere else your brain can shield itself 
and say, well, HR told me I have to do this, or the, the company told me I have to do this. When you're an agency owner or any entrepreneur and you have to let go of someone, you are the final decision maker. You will never forget that. Um, and so that, that was definitely a really tough transition for me. What made you decide to finally strike out on your own and leave American Express? Uh, I come from a family of business owners, so it was just a matter of time. Um, my dad owns an IT staff, my mom and dad together own an IT staffing business. My sister has actually uh, just taken over that business as my parents are in what I like to call semi-retirement because I don't think entrepreneurs ever actually retire. Um, so I, I always knew this was going to be the case. Interestingly enough, I actually tried to start an agency um, at, when I graduated college. Uh, and so this is actually the life cycle of uh, the agency world for me. So I, um, in college, uh, I realized I really like advertising and I can make a pretty penny with affiliate marketing on Facebook and Google ads. And uh, so that was my first step into to advertising. And if you Google my name and you go back in time, you can see some of my old stuff. And it's uh, cringeworthy to me now as I look back on things, but uh, it is uh, still pretty amazing to see that how quickly, how early I started. So graduated, um, you know, 2008 recession, uh, told my parents, I'm not going to go find a job. I'm going to start my own agency. My dad looked at me like I was crazy, but he said, cool, you've got three months to figure it out. If you can, if you can cover uh, rent that we are going to charge you in three months, you can stay here and continue building your agency. If not, you need to go get a job. Uh, lo and behold, I tried to start the agency, realized I know nothing, like literally don't understand to like anything. Um, and so obviously failed and went and uh, joined another agency. Uh, I joined a company called Morpheus Media at the time, uh, which honestly is probably one of the a pivotal moment in my career uh, and life in general, actually. So um, I've made some of my best friends, actually my best man uh, at my wedding I met at that agency. Uh, my boss at the time is still a really good friend of mine. The owner of the agency is a mentor who I still talk, chat with and talk to regularly. Uh, and so I went into that agency knowing I wanted to learn as much as I could about what it meant to have an agency, run an agency, be an agency. So I started that for a while, realized I wanted to also experience what it meant to be a startup at a startup. So I went to Stylecaster, head of marketing there, got a chance to explore what it meant like to be <laughs> in a startup, uh, what it meant to own a PL, what it meant to hire and fire, uh, all that. Uh, was Morpheus a bigger agency? Uh, mid size. Uh, so, so I would say uh, mid size agencies, small to mid size agencies are the best place to learn. Uh, you are absolutely asked to stretch beyond everything. There is a lot of just figure it out mentality, which I think is key. Um, and, and I definitely learned a lot there. Uh, and so that was helpful in terms of setting up that mentality. I think that mentality of just figuring it out is really it is key. Um, Stockcaster startup life, the insanity of startups is key. Uh, and then after that, I went to American Express. And I actually strategically went to American Express because I wanted to learn what it was like to work on marketing at the enterprise level because I thought, hey, if I'm going to sell to these guys at some point, <laughs> I should understand what happens on the other end so I can actually speak their language and understand what happens. Um, so finally, after I felt like I learned everything I could at American Express, I said, you know what, I think it's time to try again. Uh, at this point now, I had an agency experience, startup experience, and Fortune 500 experience. I felt like I was armed uh, and ready to, to kind of start this. You know, I want to talk about, so people could check out weareqry.com, okay, uh, the, the website, and you have a page, Benchmarks. Can yep. you walk me through why you created this page and what's, what's there? Yeah, so the benchmark page is really um, awesome. So we get the pleasure of working with a lot of high-growth direct-to-consumer e-com brands, and we run all of their media, which means that we run all of their advertising on paid search, paid social, display, uh, connected TV, uh, and in some cases, like even out of home or podcasts. So um, we collect a lot of data, and I think it was really important for us to share uh, high-level trends that we're seeing in the marketplace because we are a data first business. We want people to recognize um, where they should be versus where they may be. 
And so the benchmarks page actually outlines out the key KPIs that we look at on a regular basis. So total revenue growth, total revenue from advertising, um, our CPMs, so cost per million, uh, cost per mille, that's an, uh, CPCs, all the way down to conversion rate. And um, I know one of the things that we always struggled with was, are our campaigns down because the market is down or are our campaigns down because we're doing something wrong? And so uh, the, we've been using this data pretty internally. Uh, obviously, we've done only 28 days on the benchmarks for public, but for our team, we have you know, annualized data uh, that we compare and contrast against. So um, you know, for us, this is kind of our, our nexus of how we look at things and, and gauge on how we're doing. Yeah. So if you're watching the video right now, I have the page up right here. You could see some of the metrics um, <clears throat> right here with revenue, CPM, CPC, CTR, and conversion rate. As I scroll through, this is actual data. Yep. Right. Yeah, this is live to the day. So we have revenue here. Yep. Um, so what does this mean right here? Yeah. So uh, we're looking at total revenue across all of our e-com stores. So our, our clients are down a little bit over the last 28 days and a pretty volatile few weeks, uh, but we're up 35% from previous year. So on average, our clients are seeing at least a 35% growth on their, their e-com store. Uh, then we have total media revenue, which is actually how much we have driven from our advertising. People are up 80% from last year from their advertising. So uh, we've been able to, to really scale a lot of our brands. So now we'll go down to CPM for a second. Yeah. So this is the cost to advertise across all of our channels. So CPM is how much you pay for a thousand impressions. Uh, we, if you are in the media world, you've been talking about rising in, uh, inflation in advertising costs, and you're seeing it right here. I mean, we're up 14% just over the last 28 days and up 40% from last year. So costs are definitely rising. Do you see... Um... You, we were talking, I said, what's top of mind? And you mentioned uh, potential recession or, yeah. or, you know, do you think this will be affected and come down because people will drop out of advertising or how do you think that will be affected in the next yeah, year or two? It's really interesting that you asked that. So, so um, there's a few things that will happen and, and just, uh, I am not an economist by any uh, length of it. I uh, may be amateur economist at best. Uh, you so, did get your your economics to get Rutgers. I so did. We'll, I did. We'll I give did, you I, a little a little bit of street. A little bit, just enough rope to hang myself, right? Uh, <laughs> so so you know, uh, agencies tend to be lagging indicators. So we usually, uh, when a recession happens, um, we tend to get hit after the fact, which is interesting because usually media costs are cut early. But not always. Um, you know, we're doing budgeting for next year, and so if we're in recession right now, our budgets are going to be impacted next year, even though the recession's happening now. So, here is my hope. These are my dreams. If this comes to reality, I'll be super excited. Uh, I am hoping our recession is deep and quick, and we come right back, which means that. Uh, you know, maybe we're in a recessionary period this quarter, next quarter, and then are coming back in early 2023, uh, which means that our budgets won't be cut as immensely as they could be if this is a long drawn out recession. So that's, that's our hope. If, the, if it is deep, yes, I expect CPM prices to drop pretty drastically. I will say that there's another story around these CPM prices. And actually, if you scroll down, uh, I can tell this story. So CPMs are up cost per click is up as well. That's because the cost to actually um, reach someone has gone up. So then CPCs have also gone up as well. Uh, and then if you scroll down one more, our click-through rates are slightly down, which means that people are not engaging with the creative as well as they were. But then if you scroll down to the bottom, our conversion rates are up drastically though. And so what this tells me from a story perspective is, yes, it's more expensive to advertise to people. Yes, it's getting more expensive to get people to our website. And yes, only a certain subsection of people are uh, engaging with our creative, but those people are extremely valuable. And so um, it's important to look at that full story because if you only looked at the first three metrics, you'd say, oh my God, this is all broken. This is not gonna work. 
that last conversion rate data as well as the overarching numbers are really important. Yeah, that's a great point. What made you decide to share this publicly? I mean, you could just easily keep this internal with the team and talk about, have a meeting about this, the trends, why share it? Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's interesting you asked that. So similarly, what you said is uh, there's a value in giving value and it's the same thing from our perspective. You know, from, from us, you know, our vision um, for the agency, the thing that gets us really excited is how do we take brands and make them household names? Sometimes that means working with them directly and being a partner and helping them grow. And sometimes that means just being on the sideline and being able to add to the ecosystem overall. I think these benchmark data are really important for people um, because, you know, candidly, you sit there and you're like, oh, man, is is something I did broken or is the whole industry as a whole? Is there something going on in the market? You know, we, we, we are e-marketer subscribers because we want to know what trends we're seeing and forecasting. And same situation. I think it's it's um, if we can do it, we should. I want to talk you know, through a real world case example so people can kind of understand also what you do yeah. at Query. And um, so talk about Delcy. Yeah. So Delcy is an awesome example because uh, we signed on Delcy, uh, international luggage brand. They're out of France. They're an amazing brand, uh, super high quality heritage. They launched an e-com store in the US, um, wanted to really scale it. And uh, of course, COVID hit and no one's traveling anymore. Yeah. And not travel, good to be in travel. <laughs> yeah, not good to be in travel. Not only was it not good to be in travel, but uh, supply chain disruptions were uh, insane for them because think about it, they're a French manufacturer and, and have to bring it here. So um, they definitely uh, expected major struggles. Um, but you know, luckily, our team was able to work with them. We put together a strategic plan for them to help them scale pretty aggressively. And actually, they saw uh, since we ran their campaigns, uh, they increased their revenue 142 percent just in that one quarter. And uh, you know, I can I hear people in my head because I know as I'm uh, as I'm a numbers guy, I'm like, yeah, you went from 10 to 100. That's like cool. Uh, that doesn't really mean anything. Uh, I, I think the key thing is we went from 3% of their total revenue, again, large heritage um, wholesale brand to 8% of their revenue. So 142% was, was a meaningful number for them. Um, the key elements for Delcy, uh, we put together a really strategic media forecast for them using their data. Uh, we layered in information uh, around COVID and what our expectations were from there and then helped coordinate with their team to really understand their supply chain uh, issues. So what products was going to be, what products were going to be in stock versus out of stock? Uh, how could we promote what needed to be in stock? How could we promote uh, or, or create um, demand for things that would be restocked? Uh, and so we were really uh, strong partners on that end. Uh, we put together a full new framework. We help coordinate with them on creative. Um, so, so we don't actually create creative, but we do full creative briefings for our clients and use the data to help them understand what's actually going to work. Um, and because of that, it, that's the reason why they saw such great success and, and were able to really scale. When they come to you, Samir, just walk through the timeline for a second. So you put together kind of like a, a strategic media forecast. Then you're kind of analyzing that. What what happens next before yeah. you actually turn the ads on? Yeah, so before we get started with any of our clients, we do a full uh, four-week discovery, uh, four to six-week full discovery. Uh, that covers everything from, uh, tell me about the brand. Like, who are you? What's your vision? What's your mission? Who's your customer? Uh, how do you expect them to engage with you? Um, what are your competitors doing in the market? Uh, what do we plan on doing from a marketing calendar outside of media? You know, our benchmark is we don't want advertising to drive more than about 40% of your total revenue, anything more than that. And that means that it's unhealthy growth for the business. So uh, we really want to understand what's on your marketing calendar. What else are you doing? Where are you investing? How can we help you, you know, support those initiatives? Uh, so all of that happens in the, this upfront full 12 month media forecast every month broken out by customer stage, uh, broken out by all those core KPIs you just looked at, CPM, click-through rate, CPC, because we want to use this as our diagnostic. If something's not working, we go back to the media forecast and go, what's out of whack? What needs to be fixed? Uh, so that, that gets done. We also put together what we call a learning agenda. Uh, it's an ad experimentation plan that says, hey, because of these KPIs, this is what we want to be testing. 
And they were prioritizing it based on uh, what we think the impact will be and our confidence level in that impact. Uh, and so that's been really helpful for making sure that we're constantly iterating on the campaigns and driving that incremental value over time. Once that's all done, client signs off on it. Usually budget sign off is the one that takes the longest. Um, then our team says, okay, great. We're going to take over. We take over campaigns. We build out campaigns into our structure and our frameworks uh, and we run from there. And so <clears throat> we talked a little bit before we hit record about what it means to grow a direct-to-consumer brand. And, you know, with that store, some have store, you know, actually brick and mortar, some don't. So how do you think about growing as a direct consumer brand now? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I was on LinkedIn this morning and the, the first thing that pops up is um, somebody on my feed going, D2C is dead. And obviously it was a very like tongue in cheek because then you open it up and he's like, no, D2C is not dead. This, these are all the reasons why it's not dead. And, um, you know, I my response was 100%. Nah, D2C is not dead. But the idea of a D2C brand, I think is going to change. Um, and the reason why I say that is because uh, direct to consumer is a channel. Uh, it's how we reach consumers. Uh, we don't build brands around channels. We build brands around the the need that they serve or the customer that they reach. Um, you know, no one would say I am a Facebook brand. Like, you know, but you're not just a Facebook brand. There are other options and other abilities. So I think that the people are starting to realize that that is the case, and that um, there's an evolution happening in direct to consumer. How do you feel brick and mortar fits into this? Uh, you know, ultimately, I think brick and mortar and wholesale are so important. Um, it, it does two things. So, you know, uh, agencies feel this pain, right? Uh, ability to enter into the agency world is really easy. You know, there, there's no nothing stopping you from spinning up an agency tomorrow. But how do you differentiate yourself uh, from everyone else? And there are certain validations that you need to do. Um, for retail brands, it's really easy to validate. I'm in Nordstrom. Cool. I, I have instant validation. I have a brick and mortar store. Great. Instant validation. So I think one of the things that we're going to start to see is uh, direct-to-consumer brands rethinking what it means to be wholesale partners, what it means to have brick and mortar locations that they own and operate. Because it's not only about how much revenue did I generate from that store, but it's also how much brand awareness or marketing equivalents do we drive from being there that then supported my direct-to-consumer store, right? Um, I think that the idea of how everything plays together is going to start to become more and more important. Um, and it has, it, it's already really important, but I think it's going to be a bigger question. And uh, I think what we're starting to see is direct-to-consumer going from this is what's going to solve all of our woes to, oh, this is just another tool in our toolbox. And we're going to have to do other things as well. Who do you look at as a brand to just, who do you recommend people look at? Like when I think, when you say that certain brands pop in my mind, like Warby Parker that started direct to consumer, and then they have, you know, retail popping up. Who do you look at? And maybe, maybe we've heard of them. Maybe it's like, here's a brand to look at. You know, it's really interesting. I don't know that anyone's done it well across the board. I think that that's the problem. So there is one that stands out to me. I think Harry's did a great job. And specifically, you know, Harry's direct to consumer, they were launched online. Great story. Um, the thing that stood out to me was when they did wholesale to Target, they didn't just wholesale all of their products. They created a wholesale, uh, they created a specific product for Target. It was their razor in Target Red. And I think that that is really unique because it didn't cannibalize their direct-to-consumer products, If you, but it did build brand awareness for their brand. And so I think the strategy of uh, how you enter into wholesale, how you enter into brick and mortar is going to needs to shift the product sets, how you present yourself, all of that. Uh, and that's where I think direct-to-consumer brands are in a really... Um, unique position to win. They don't have any of the legacy baggage that retail brands have where they've had to already open up their entire product portfolio and say, okay, cool. You have to have all of us. You, you know, Hey, retailer, a, you have pricing control over us. You have discounting control over us. Um, and, and so that's where I think uh, direct to consumer 
uh, that leverage that they bring by having their own customer base is really valuable. You also worked with Peak Design. Yeah, they're an awesome brand. If you um, if you're into photography, if you're into uh, mobile phones, like you want to go explore, check them out. I can't be more excited about working with them. What do you do for Peak Design? Yeah, so we run all of their media as well, um, and uh, they're a, a super cool brand. Um, and our, our uh, contact list there is just awesome too. Super smart. Um, what I would say is uh, they uh, like to run. And uh, so we've had to be really good partners for them and, and just be uh, available and, and help them really think through what are big things that are going to make big changes, big impacts. And, uh, you know, bring some of our rigor and frameworks uh, to them has helped them unlock a lot of growth. Uh, and help them scale in a very meaningful way. Also, you know, another thing that we do um, that we end up having to educate a lot of our clients on is how we look at um, the effectiveness of advertising, right? Uh, and what it means to be uh, effective. So we do this in a really unique way. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, if you are an e com store owner, you've probably seen these ads all the time. We promise a six times return on ad spend, 14 times return on ad spend. Uh, you know, we'll show you, read this case study on how so-and-so brand invested a dollar and made $20 back. All of those are crap. Uh, and I like, it, it just bothers me when I see that stuff. So here, here are the reasons why. One, uh, one of two things is happening. One, uh, the agency is using what is called attributed numbers. Uh, that's from the platform itself. So, hey, Facebook, hey, I'm Facebook. I'm going to tell you that when you ran this dollar, this amount of people purchased from you. Great. In, you know, if you're small, feel free to use those numbers. But as you scale, you can't. And the reason why is because uh, Facebook, Google, all these guys do two things. They do what's called attribution windows. So, uh, uh, they may do a one day view, which means I viewed the product and then purchased in that. I didn't ever engage with it, but I just purchased. So I'll take credit for that. Uh, or seven day click. I clicked on the ad and within seven days I purchased. Fine. But here's the problem. What if I saw a Facebook ad and then clicked a Google ad and now who, do, who gets attribution? Well, if you just add them together, you can end up in a situation where your attributed media revenue is larger than your total e-com revenue. And we have seen that happen. And so we do not uh, use attributed for reporting. What we do is we use last click. And obviously, as brands uh, get better, there's data-driven and modeling out there. But for an easy way of getting started, we use last click. What's a last click? It's in Google Analytics. What was the last channel somebody interacted with that finally led to the purchase, right? And what that allows us to do is it dedupes everything. So we only, you can only have one last person. Uh, and, and that allows us to have a really clear view of things. What it, the downsides of it is uh, it overestimates Google and underestimates uh, things like Facebook, all those brand awareness elements. The way we solve for that is we've created internal benchmarks that we know. You know, Facebook is going to do X, Y, and Z. We want to target this benchmark because we know that we'll see the halo. So that's one. The second thing that we do is we tell our clients, we're going to work with you. Let's figure out what your product margins are. Let's solve for what we call your break-even return on ad spend. What is the uh, lowest return on ad spend that we can drive to that will still drive revenue for the business without you know, losing on that product. And we know that we'll make your margin on the halo that comes from advertising, right? Because we're looking at last click super conservative. We're not taking into account any view throughs uh, or anybody that didn't, you know, click to Google ad and then click to Google search ad. We know we'll make that money there. What that does is it solves two things. One, it allows us to invest in real time in brand awareness and brand building audience development for the brand while growing top line revenue. So what ends up happening is we start to see brands stay at that low ROAS while, top, by, while re, uh, revenue continues to increase over time because we're building awareness, turning them into customers, and our ability to spend on those remarketing conversion ads increases over time. And so that's how we've been able to scale. It takes a lot of education on our clients uh, and um, 
it definitely is a mind shift to mindset shift for a lot of them. How does lifetime value play into that? Because I could feel like with that, and I love how you broke it down, break even return on ad spend. You're basically acquiring customers for free or you're making money on customers, but there is a lifetime value of people that are going to purchase. So how does lifetime value play into that? It does. And so, um, you know, lifetime value is great. It's also dangerous. Uh, And so, you know, SaaS platforms love using lifetime value. I love lifetime value for SaaS platforms. I get nervous about lifetime value for uh, consumer brands and retail brands. We use it. It is a secondary metric for us. And here's the reason why LTV can get really, you got to be really careful about LTV. Um, when we run advertising for campaign for clients, and this is actually, you know, Jeremy, you and I were talking about privacy concerns and how that impacts it. So this is actually one of those areas where privacy starts to play out. I can't clearly create a campaign that only targets net new consumers. So there is an opportunity that the purchase that I acquired is an existing customer. I just paid to advertise against them. So if I start um, optimizing my campaigns to lifetime value, I may end up in a situation where I'm actually losing a lot of money because some percentage of my customers are actually not new to the business. Um, and so we definitely use it as a secondary metric. We include it in our break-even ROAS calculations when we're, when we're able to. So we'll do like a percentage new to file from advertising index in there. Um, but it's definitely something that I would recommend clients, especially in retail fashion you know, apparel, be really careful about. Um, you know, SaaS has it easy. You acquire the customer once, you're rebilling on them. You never have to pay to acquire them again. LTV makes great sense. Uh, but in retail, you are you are literally paying to reacquire customers over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. And what goes through mind too, even with Delcy as well, how many times am I buying luggage? You know, I buy it. I don't know if I, when I'm buying it again. Maybe but, once a year, like max. Yeah. Right. You, maybe never. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. You know, but those say, you know, you may tell family, oh, where'd you get that? And that may be, you can't really, it's hard to attribute someone just, you know, that came in from an ad five years later goes, oh, I love your luggage. Where'd you get it? I got it from Delcy. And then they tell their family and they buy the luggage too. Right. You know, one of the things that um, an understated tool that not a lot of people use that I I think is actually really important. We're trying to help our clients understand the value of is um, how did you find us tools? So uh, Enquire Labs is a great tool for Shopify um, that we really like. And uh, they are on your Shopify checkout. They ask you like, how how did you find us? And you add that in and it helps you really quantify some of that. And obviously it is directional because you're not going to be creating major plans around some of it, but it does allow you to get a better understanding of the impacts of things and you know, what is your word of mouth? Like we, we would love to see more word of mouth. That means you have a good product, right? Are you finding a lot of the um, sites that you work with? Cause you're driving them to pages and things. Are they using Shopify? Uh, we are 95% of our clients are on Shopify. Hmm. Um, we are big Shopify fans. Uh, I would recommend being on Shopify. The ecosystem is really fantastic. And um it's it's rare that you're trying to do something that Shopify can't, to be fair. Uh, and honestly, also, uh, one of our core values is simplify. Um, I think that if you are trying to do something that Shopify can't, you may want to rethink it because your consumer may not be able to actually really understand it. Uh, and so, you know, I think the, the value in some of these tools and um, you know, from a UX standpoint, I just want it to be brainless and mindless and quick and easy. Uh, the less obstacles, the better. So I have two last questions. One, I want to hear about your favorite Shopify apps, right? Because the more your customers, you know, your clients incorporate these things, the, you know, it helps them make more money, obviously. And before you answer that, I just want to know who's ideal, who's an ideal client for you? Someone's listening to this. Maybe they know of a brand. Who's, who should be contacting you? Yeah, yeah. Um, if you want to work with us, our ideal client, is uh, an e-com store, uh, 2 million in revenue at least. Uh, most of our clients are spending at least uh, a million uh, in advertising a year. 
it's the point at which we're actually able to really scale uh, you and, and our framework really comes to its fruition. You don't need to be quite at that level. You, if you have a path to that, that's fine for us. Um, we'll you know, definitely reach out to us. We also do a quick review of your core KPIs because we have an internal index that we use to really understand if, we're, if we would be able to be successful. So uh, we are very careful about the clients that we bring on. There's a reason why we have a 30% annual revenue growth and uh, average 80% year over year media growth. So um, we can quickly tell who would be successful. With. We recommend you reach out, schedule a call with our our strategists, and we'll be able to either tell you if we'll be successful or be give you the path to that uh, for sure. Uh, in terms of partners that we love working with, so uh, I am a big uh, big fan of Enquire Labs, which you just heard about. Uh, Try Now is another really cool tool uh, that I would recommend you guys check out. Uh, the whole concept around uh, trying before you buy has become really big, especially fashion apparel, you know, lifestyle brands as a whole. Uh, having the ability to, to try things has been really cool. Um, we work with a company called Recart pretty regularly. I would check them out. Um, and then not a Shopify app, but something that's been super interesting. They're called uh, Lose Data. Uh, they do a lot of data sets for e-com brands and, and shopping and pricing information. That's been really helpful also. Um, I'm trying to think of who else has been. Any other favorite Shopify apps or or tools in e-commerce? Yeah, I think um, there's two like influencer groups that we've been really liking. So hashtag paid and a company called Coley. I would check them out for influencer management. Uh, How do you spell Coley? Uh, C-O-H-L-E-Y. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, and I, I definitely check out a company called blackcrow.ai. Um, they have been super cool in being able to unlock some of our, uh, some data sets for us, uh, which has been awesome. Uh, and, and I think that, the, uh, that, especially as we talk privacy and cookie data going away, being able to access your own first party data uh, in, a, in a different way or zero party data as I like to call it in a, in a different way has been uh, really awesome. So that's probably, I can, as a follow-up, I can also send you some more just um, yeah. uh, to include in the show notes for sure. I don't know when you're talking to clients, if they mention any of their favorites, I know some stuff that's come up in my conversation, people have used Yapo. I, I forgot yeah. what that is for, but that's come up in conversation um and uh there, there's so many out there i'm sure people there's so can... many i think uh it's actually interesting i think we'll have to write it uh here's our favorite shopify tech stack uh exactly. for sure you know a lot of the times so yapo is great for ratings and reviews clavio for email uh for us we tend to really just look at it from a media perspective so we don't really get to see the whole picture regularly um because it really, there's so many options out there and, and just so much that you can do with it, which is why uh, whenever someone says, you know, we, we didn't do Shopify because we couldn't get what we needed to, I'm like, I don't think you, you tried everything you needed to, to be able to do it. So um, yeah, I think that there's, there's a lot. Um, there's one that I actually really um, am going to call out and goes back to our, our, our give back. There's a company called Shopping Gives, uh, which I would check out and they do the whole, uh, if you've ever been to, I don't know, I think like CBS and ShopRite and all these guys do it. You go and would you like to round up to to donate to your you know local charity? Uh, Shopping Gives incorporates that into Shopify directly, so hmm. people can round up on their process. So, uh, that's if cool. you have any charitable portion of your business, that's a really easy way to kind of get it front and center. Shopping Gives, love it. Yeah. Samir, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone, check out. We are query.com, which is we, W-E-A-R-E-Q-R-Y.com. Learn more, Samir. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. This is great. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a beach if you find the sailing right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.